All right. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hello, guys. Uh, welcome to Grand Rounds. We have a good one today. Um, fatty liver, quite a topic. I'm sure, uh, you know, we've seen it. Maybe some have it. So we're lucky enough to have Dr. Cohen join us today. He's the medical director of hepatology at UH and a professor of medicine at the K School of Medicine. He got his medical degree from USC. He did his residency at UCSD. He did his hepatology fellowship at USC. He did his GI fellowship at UCLA. He's been on the faculty at several institutions and has been the hepatology director at several institutions before coming to UH in 2012. He is triple board in internal medicine, gastroenterology, and transplant hepatology. He is a fellow of the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease and the American College of Gastroenterology. He has numerous publications on a variety of liver-related topics, and he is also an active researcher on multiple topics in liver disease. So without further ado, Dr. Cohen. Well, thank you very much. This was very much a last-minute grand round, so this may not be my best effort of all time, so I apologize for that, but uh, I think someone else must have canceled, so we put it together here. And so before you even ask, yes, I came from L.A. to Cleveland, and uh, I decided I would do the opposite of LeBron. So <laughs> anyway, these are my disclosures. I have a ton of slides in here because I know these things get archived, so some of it I'm just going to refer people to come back to later if they want to look at them. So we're going to skim through a lot. I have to acknowledge two of my colleagues, Joan and Naim El Khoury, for helping to provide some slides on uh, some of the pathophysiology. We're going to talk briefly about the fatty liver disease, really the epidemiology, and that's probably where I'll spend most of my time on. We'll very briefly discuss what liver tests are and what normal and abnormal are. And finally, we'll talk about therapeutic options. So what's the problem? There it is. We're done. I mean, it's a quick talk. <laughs> and, you know, what we find here is the, you know, supersizing everything. And so this, for the moment, is still going to be the main problem and the main treatment. Again, easy to say, not so hard to do, or I should say, not easy to do. And again, sort of the progression of uh, modern man. So this study just came out a couple months ago in the New England Journal. I found it to be quite fascinating. And so it's obesity in the United States. And using their definition of moderate being 30 to 35, severe being over 35, within 10 years from now, half the U.S. population will qualify as being obese. A quarter will be severely obese. And if you looked at all women, all black adults, and all low-income adults, severe obesity will become the most common BMI category for those groups. And so if you look here between 1990 and 2030, you see on the um, left there, okay, yeah, on the left there you see prevalence of obesity, on the right you see prevalence of severe obesity. And what you're noticing here in yellow is 10 to 20 percent, and as you go down there, especially in the south and in the Midwest, you'll see these numbers potentially exceeding 50, 60 percent. And then um, on the far side, the severe obesity, you're seeing green where it's very, very uncommon, getting into the yellow and orange where, again, we said you're going to get 20 to 30 percent. And I don't think these numbers are going to be that far off. So in terms of fatty liver, there's alcoholic and non-alcoholic. I do not necessarily agree with the uh, guidelines and the societies, but what they claim is that you can drink up to 21 drinks a week for male, 14 drinks a week for a female and not be considered alcoholic liver disease. So I'll leave that to you guys, but the point is that's what the societies say. We're going to focus over here on non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is kind of the big spectrum, and then we're going to sort of look at simple fatty liver, which we might call NAFL or NAFL, versus NASH. NASH is the bad player that goes on to the big problem. So we'll come back to that. So in terms of the classification, luckily the far majority of patients just have the simple fat or NAFL. And you see there on the biopsy that you've got fat, you don't have any inflammatory cells, trust me there's no fibrosis, and this is the one that might be self-limited, but if you keep pushing it, you may end up with NASH. 
if we go from there, the next one we'll see is that about a quarter of these patients will have NASH. The bad player is the H, the hepatitis. So it's the hepatitis or inflammation that leads on to the potential for fibrosis, cirrhosis, et cetera. And in fact, if we take a little chunk out of the NASH patients, about 20% of them will actually have advanced fibrosis. Just for those of you who don't know this, stage four is cirrhosis. So stage three and four is classified as advanced fibrosis. And this is the part that we really are concerned with. Now, in terms of the global prevalence, the most common liver disease in the United States is not hepatitis C, despite what the drug company advertising makes you think. It's fatty liver. One in four people in this country has fatty liver. But more importantly, one in four people on the planet has fatty liver. And it's interesting when you look at areas like Africa, where it must be zero because there's so much malnourishment there, well, it's not. Even there, it's 13%. So it's not all just being overweight and eating bad food. There's genetics and environmental factors. I don't know how much I care about this. I care about this, though. This is the NASH. This is the bad player. And if you look here, really 5 to 10-ish percent of the world's population has NASH. And we'll come back to it, but if a quarter of NASH goes on to cirrhosis and all the complications of liver disease, these are staggering numbers. So in terms of where we're estimated to be as of 2017 in the U.S., 83 million people with some variant of fatty liver, non-alcohol, 16.5 million with NASH, and about three, three and a half million with advanced NASH or advanced fibrosis. So this is why I see Seth over here. Seth and I spend our lives in clinics seeing fatty liver after fatty liver, different than 10 years ago when it was hep C after hep C. Now, granted, in Cleveland, we probably still see more alcohol, but that's neither here nor there. Now, what about the progression? And this is one of the more important slides in the deck here. And what you're going to see is where we're going between 2015 and 2030. So these are changes. And so what we're going to see here is we're going to see 150 to 200 percent increase in the amount of people getting advanced fibrosis, cirrhosis, liver-related deaths, and then obviously huge increases in the number of NASH and NAFL patients. So again, really from a liver standpoint, this is quite the epidemic. Financially, uh, estimated in this study out of uh, 2016, $103 billion attributable to fatty liver disease. Now, on the right here, uh, fatty liver either is or soon will be number one cause of cirrhosis, liver-related mortality, liver cancer, need for transplant. Interestingly, no one has ever heard of fatty liver. Every patient comes in with the same answer. I never drank. I don't have hepatitis. How could this have happened? The reason they've never heard of it, if there ain't no drug money, there ain't no advertising, plain and simple. When the first drugs hit the market, you will have hundreds of patients in your practice coming in to get their fatty liver addressed. But again, it's really going to come down to advertising and marketing. So in terms of the risk factors, the risk factors are really pretty straightforward. Let's just look at it here. It really comes down to fatty liver is the liver manifestation of the metabolic syndrome. So when you look at it, it's really obesity, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, and then obviously alcohol can be another contributor here. And when you look at the numbers here, you find 70, 80% of them will have one or many of these different factors. Now, in terms of general screening, this is something that is a bit uh, controversial, which is that someone who's obese and or diabetic and or hyperlipidemic with normal liver tests, let me emphasize that, with normal liver tests, the current guidelines do not recommend screening them with ultrasound, et cetera. That's different than elevated numbers, which we'll come back to in a minute. Yet, interestingly, for the younger people in our audience, you will learn to read guidelines. And guidelines will say absolutely asinine things. They will say, do not do this, and the next statement will be, go ahead and do that. Here's a great example. So, do not screen them if they have normal labs. Yet, the next one says, do have a high index of suspicion and go ahead and think about looking into it. 
So bottom line, I'm not quite sure what the guidelines say. What we have mostly been doing is if the liver tests are normal, we really have not been screening them per se. Uh, again, not opposed to it, but the way I might look at it is you went from normal liver enzymes, feeling great, looking great. We did a fibrosis scan. It showed something worrisome. We now did a biopsy. We now have a complication. Let's go to the far end of the spectrum. You died from the biopsy, and now all of a sudden I had a patient that felt great, looked great, and had perfectly normal enzymes, and we put them through a workup that killed them. So not quite sure if we should be doing this just yet. This can and will change if and when we get effective treatments for fatty liver. So part of this statement on the top is that we don't have effective treatments right now, at least pharmacologic treatments. We'll talk about what we do have. So when we get a lot of people coming in with AST, ALT of 10, and you kind of get a sense from us we're not overly worried about doing anything right now, this is part of the reason why. There is no recommendation for screening family members currently. Okay, what is a normal LFT? And again, we don't like the word LFTs. Uh, they're called liver enzymes, liver tests, whatever you want to call them, but everyone still refers to them as LFTs, so I will too. So I was one of the authors for the 2017 American College Guidelines, so I know what I'm talking about on this. This is what normal liver enzymes are. Okay, now when I first got here, if I remember right, Ahuja's upper limit of normal on ALT was 64 or 65. This is what it should be. I don't care what the lab says it is. If you go above these numbers, you have a higher risk of badness, either liver-related mortality, all-cause mortality. Why would that be? What's the most common reason for abnormal liver tests in the U.S. right now? Fatty liver. What happens when you got too much fat in the liver? you got too much fat in the coronary arteries, et cetera. So it's no big surprise that the concept of fatty liver with metabolic syndrome is going to translate into issues with morbidity mortality. And the numbers are quite staggering when you look at them. So I just pulled three. I mean, when we put together the guidelines, we pulled about 25 of these. But if you take a look here, it's very intriguing. So... In this particular group, they used AST of 18 as their cutoff. If you were above 18, three-time increased risk of all-cause mortality, implying 19, 21, 22 for AST. Again, not saying that maybe that's a bit of an exaggeration, but that's what their study showed. Here, you see that if you got above the 45 and 29 range, depending on where you were, 32% mortality rate increase, 78%. Here, if you were above their 30 and 19 for men and women, you had increased liver-related mortality. So the point is that when the lab tells you that 64 is the upper limit of normal and 63 is fine, it isn't really fine. People should really be more down in the 20s. We learned this in the era of hepatitis C when we would treat people with an ALT of 63 cure them, and the ALT would drop to 7. And all of a sudden you realize, gee, the ALT was technically normal, but in fact it was seven times higher than it was after treatment. So this is the guideline we put forth for the mildly elevated uh, AST, ALT, really ALT. And so I just bring it up just to focus on these two areas that if you have people with elevated liver tests, common things being common, you should look for alcohol use, you should look for fatty liver, and you should look for hepatotoxic drugs. And early on, you're going to think about doing your ultrasound. Notice we're not doing ceruloplasmins and alpha-1s and all kinds of weirdo serologies. We're focusing on common things. In terms of NASH clinical presentation, again, tends to be overweight women, a lot of diabetes, a lot of hyperlipidemia, especially triglycerides. And, again, most of the time they're asymptomatic unless they've read the Internet. If they've read the Internet, they're going to have a thousand symptoms and signs that the Internet tells them they're going to have. We do not see much right upper quadrant pain with fatty liver. We tend to see a lot of right upper quadrant pain after fatty liver is diagnosed. But, again, at least theoretically on the Internet, it says that you can get abdominal pain. Now, in terms of lab tests, just remember alcohol and do the opposite. So alcohol, we all know, is AST over ALT. 
non-alcoholic fatty liver, the exact opposite. ALT is higher than AST. These are not 500s, 1000s, 2000s. These are more 50s to 100s, 50s to 150s. We do see elevated ferritin levels in these patients, sometimes as part of the process, sometimes as an inflammatory component. There have been some studies saying that the higher the ferritin in fatty liver, the worse the potential outcomes. Again, they're a little bit weak studies. We'll see where that goes. Now, in terms of the natural history, I think what we have to realize is simple fatty liver, and I'll show you some slides here. Simple fatty liver can reverse with correction of the underlying risk factors. Again, be that the alcohol, the non-alcohol, all the risk factors. But with time, what we start to see is progression to NASH. This is all I care about, NASH, because notice once we get here, we're going to see 20 to 25 percent of our NASH patients are going to go on to advanced fibrosis and cirrhosis, and that's where you run into the problems of liver disease. Now, notice here, it takes about seven years to progress from stage to stage to stage. Well, you know, I'm 60 years old. I'm not, but I'm 60 years old. I have stage zero. I don't need to worry because I'll be too old to worry about it by the time I get there. Well, it isn't quite that linear, and you need to let your patients know. There is a converse to it, which is we do have some 25-year-olds with stage two. It doesn't mean they're absolutely going to go to cirrhosis, but... The point is these are kind of rough terms. Once you get to the advanced fibrosis, then we get into the badness, liver cancer, liver transplant, liver, I'll use the word liver failure, uh, but the point is we get into all the complications. Now, for simple steatosis, this might be the NAFL, the NAFL, and these were older studies, but, you know, not big studies, but the point was they followed 40 patients with simple fat, no hepatitis, no fibrosis, and 20 years later, they had no progression of their disease. Not exactly clear what they did for them, if they treated them. And they actually went back 14 years later to look at the same group again. So in essence, you're at 33 years, no change in mortality for this group. So if it stays a simple fat, you're probably okay. Now, then you get into the NASH. As I said, this was the bad player. For those of us old enough to remember practicing back before this was really well described, we did not separate simple fatty liver from NASH. We patted them all on the back and said, go lose some weight and get out of here and don't drink. But Bruce Bacon coined this really in 1994 and started to show that this actually does have significant fibrosis progression. And again, up to a quarter of these patients will go on to cirrhosis. And this is where this disease really took off. And when you take a look here, you'll see significantly decreased survival. Again, unlike simple fat, but this shouldn't surprise us because in addition to liver-related issues, these people probably have more issues relating to their metabolic syndrome. In the interest of time, I didn't show you all the slides that predicted which patients with simple fat go on to NASH, but it was more obesity, it was higher blood sugar, it was higher lipids. So again, no big surprise, they should also get potentially more cardiac issue and more cerebrovascular issues. Now, remember we said the classic rule, one year, uh, sorry, one stage every seven years. Well, here's just an example of a study, and this was a study that looked at a drug that turned out to be completely useless. And so the simtuzumab did not uh, show any benefit in fatty liver, but it made for a nice natural history study. They were, in essence, getting treated with placebo. Well, take a look here. 20-ish percent of them went from stage 3 to stage 4 in two years. 20% of them had a liver event, the cirrhotics, within two years. So the point is that the seven years per stage is a rough guide, but it may not be as accurate as we think. Now, we'll come back in a second and talk about biopsy. You can argue that maybe the first biopsy under or overstaged them a little bit, and there is something to that. But I think the point is that fibrosis can progress probably more rapidly than the seven years. When you take a look here, we'll just look at the right here. The single most important thing with fatty liver and NASH is fibrosis. 
If there's no fibrosis in general, there's no problem from a liver standpoint. When you get fibrosis, the liver badness occurs. And as we see here, as we traipse along to the right, we start to run into major problems with liver-related mortality as we get into F3 or F4, which is cirrhosis. So the key thing is prevention and or regression of the fibrosis, and that probably is the holy grail of fatty liver therapy that we'll talk about. Now, we talked about these risk factors a second ago for advanced fibrosis, older, worse diabetes control, worse obesity, etc. I had my record a month ago. I had a hemoglobin A1C of 19% sent to me with normal enzymes, and I kind of wrote back and said maybe we ought to treat that. But anyway, neither here nor there. Okay, imaging studies. They're helpful and they're not helpful. They're helpful to identify fatty liver. And again, we can go through this ad nauseum, but the point is they can tell us if there's fatty liver, they can look for other stuff in the liver. But what they can't tell us is who has simple fat, who has NASH, and who has advanced fibrosis. Now, obviously, if somebody has gross cirrhosis, yeah, the ultrasound will show it, but it's not going to be able to tell you an F2 from an F3. So the point is we need something better. So liver biopsy, there's the gold standard, or as I might describe it, the tarnished gold standard. And there's two things we look at in any liver biopsy, the grade of it and the stage of it. The grade is how much inflammation. So for NASH or NAFLD, we use this NAS score. This is kind of the grading score that you see there looks at the amount of steatosis, the lobular inflammation, and the ballooning. So you may see us give you a grade, and that's what this is. And then there's the staging. That's the amount of scar tissue. Simplistic way of a metavir, stage zero, no scar tissue. Stage four is cirrhosis, and then you have the three stages in between. There are other scoring systems. Most of us use metavir. So when you get a biopsy result back, you should see NASH, grade something, stage something. Now, biopsy is great. It's the gold standard. Well, is it? Number one, it's invasive procedure. There is a finite mortality associated with it. It runs anywhere from three to six, three to seven thousand dollars to get it done. And one of the problems is, depending on what study you look at, 20 to 40 percent of the time, you may be off by a stage plus or minus. So that's why I say it's the gold standard, but it can be quite the tarnished gold standard. So, and also, let's be honest, are we going to biopsy 25% of the U.S. population with fatty liver? Even if we could, it's not realistic to even think about it. So we get into these so-called non-invasive markers of fibrosis. We have a whole series of these blood tests. Some of them are numbers you can calculate. Some of them are numbers you can put into your cell phone. Some of them you have to plug into a computer. But the point is they'll come back and give you a score. And... They're pretty accurate. I mean, they're in the 70 to 90 percent range for area under the curve. And this is, again, just a whole bunch of these. And then we'll talk about these imaging-based studies. This is what we're really using at this point. Some people are using combos. But when you hear us talk about the fibro scan, that's one of these. This is ultrasound-based transient elastography. And what we're going to do is we're going to look for liver stiffness, which correlates to the degree of fibrosis, and we're going to look at the amount of fatty tissue here. Now, again, this still doesn't tell us NASH or no NASH, but you can probably make an estimate that if somebody has significant fat and has scarring with no other cause, you're probably dealing with NASH. But the point is, for the moment, the only test that can tell you NASH or no NASH is still a biopsy. So I'll throw in some pictures here. You're starting to fall asleep. It's like, let's talk treatment. Okay. Now, I almost never combine pathogenesis and treatment, like with hep C or anything, but in fatty liver, I'm going to show you why I'm doing it, because when we have a little better understanding of the pathogenesis here, we'll have a better idea of the treatment, or at least the treatment options. So really, the way that I look at this is, the principal primary involved event here of metabolic syndrome and fatty liver is insulin resistance. And again, this is HIT1, diabetes, obesity, hyperlipidemia. And then a certain group goes on 
to get this benign NAFLD, and then some other group gets this second hit, which we'll talk about, and goes on to NASH. And it's very interesting. I could have replaced this slide with alcohol abuse, simple steatosis, and acute alcoholic hepatitis. Ironically, the numbers are very similar, and there's a trigger for both groups. Now, when you see slides like this that some of my colleagues let me, I don't want you to really pay much attention to it, other than the idea of what are these other hits. So the simple one is too much fat, but why do some people get lipotoxicity, inflammation that leads to fibrosis? But you also get an idea here of some of our targets, and this is why I combine the pathogenesis with the treatment, because maybe we can treat the cytokines, maybe we can treat the pro-inflammatory issues, the fibrosis issues. And so I'm going to simplify it even further and say, in my mind, there's three things here. Too much fat, too much inflammation, too much fibrosis. So I'm already sort of triggering my therapies, or at least my potential therapeutic approaches here, and I might even be looking at combination therapies. So I'm sort of looking at these red lines here of if I can get rid of too much fat, or I can block the inflammation, or I can block the fibrosis, I can prevent this progression. Now, what you start to see are many charts like this. These are all the phase one drugs. Some of them are phase two, and very few are phase three. And you start to get the idea, we can try this one, this one, this one, this one, et cetera. And I'll tell you, at the end of our talk, we're not going to come up with an FDA-approved drug yet but I'm just trying to give you an idea that we're making dramatic progress. Five years ago, this talk would have ended at the end of the uh, epidemiology. And so the two that I'm going to focus on, sorry, are going to be obetacolic acid and a RAM call, and I'll tell you in a minute why we're going to focus on those. And then I think where we're really heading to is this kind of tailored approach. We're going to take the people with the mild disease, start with diet, when it gets a little bit worse, we're going to do diet plus maybe some medicines. When it gets worse, we're going to look at the anti-inflammatories and anti-fibrotics. So the first step for all of these patients, same thing as alcohol. If you're a drinker, the first step is stop drinking. Forget drugs, stop drinking. For here, the primary problem seems to be based around metabolic syndrome. The first thing you need to do is work on diet, weight loss, exercise. And again, someone will say, well, what about the thin NASH patients? We're not going to talk about them today. They're rare. They do occur. But the point is, simple things first. Now, the big, hot, and sexy diet right now is the Mediterranean diet. For those of us old enough to know, wait another year, there will be the new hot and sexy diet. There is no diet that is perfect. There is no diet that is easy to follow. Plain and simple, the best therapy currently for fatty liver is the amount of weight loss. And so, more importantly, it doesn't seem to matter how you get there, it's getting there. And this is really the most important thing that we teach our patients about when it comes to treatment right now. The more weight you lose, the better. But I'm going to focus right here on this brown little area, resolution of the NASH, and then the blue area, resolution of the fibrosis. So we're not talking improvement. We're talking complete reversal of the disease theoretically with 7 to 10% body weight loss. On the bad side, 30% get 5%, 18% get 7%, less than 10% will ever achieve that greater than 10%. So the point is we work on it. We think about uh, getting them into dietitians, et cetera, easier said than done. Why is it difficult? Again, same slide I showed you before, but I didn't have McDonald's and Burger King on this one. So same exact principle. Now let's get to step two. Step two is where we aren't yet, but where we're going. And so these are the agents that we're looking at and trying to figure out what we're going to do. Hepatitis C treatment is very easy. One virus, one drug, you're done. You're targeting it. The concept of one drug somehow taking care of too much fat, inflammation, fibrosis, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, I would love to find that pill. I can't imagine it exists. So I just don't think the concept of one pill doing this 
is likely to happen. So why am I wasting your time if there's nothing FDA approved? Because we're making progress. So these are the agents currently available for type 2 diabetes that may actually help NASH or NAFLD. And if you look on the right, none of those are doing much in the liver world. If you look on the left, we have GLP-1s, which are showing some promise, but a bit too early. They're being studied right now. Pioglitazone, showing some promise, but concern for cardiac toxicity. So again, being studied a bit more, but not overly encouraging. And then there's vitamin E, which if you don't care about the increased risk of prostate cancer or the increased risk of all-cause mortality, might be a good choice, but those make me a little nervous. And the guidelines, are, again, go back to our guidelines, vitamin E is the drug of choice for fatty liver disease currently. Next paragraph, it may increase your risk of death. Nah. So, again, I did not write that guideline. That one I did not write. So, anyway, so to sum it up where we're at at the moment, for FDA-approved medicines for other indications. Metformin, there's no evidence that it helps. Uh, pioglitazone, again, might be helpful. Cardiac issues, uh, the GLP-1s are being studied. Now, I throw in, so again, none are currently FDA-approved. I threw in statins because this is a question I get all the time. Statins are not approved for fatty liver disease. However, they are approved for one of the components of fatty liver disease, obviously hyperlipidemia. Do not do what um, most of my uh, referring docs do, which is that when someone's diagnosed with fatty liver that's been there 25 years, do not stop the statin tomorrow that they've been on for 20 years with fantastic control of their lipids. They are not going to die from the statin despite what the commercial tells you. And so the point is that in my mind, this is a treatment for a component of fatty liver disease. Now, that's different than starting someone on a statin, the enzymes go to 300, that's a different beast. Also, decompensated cirrhotics, it is not recommended to use statins. So the point is you don't need to jump in and stop the statin and it probably is helpful. So in terms of the future treatments, let's get a little more optimistic and happier here. I'm gonna focus on two of them. Uh, number one is going to be the obeta-colic acid, an FXR agonist, and then a RAM call. This will be approved probably around June for fatty liver disease. Do not rush out and go call your stockbroker. I think that this will be a huge bust, but we'll come back to it in a few minutes and I'll show you why. Why did I focus on this? Because I'm opening a study next week on this one here, so it's not that it's any better. But the point is, you see all of these in phase two trials with some of them going into phase three. So there is a lot of excitement going on. So what is this obeta-colic acid? It's FDA approved for PBC, primary biliary cholangitis. And we're not exactly sure why it's helping fatty liver. You see a lot of proposed mechanisms here. It may decrease fibrosis, it may help bile acid, homeostasis, it may decrease uh, inflammation. And so here's one of the phase two trials, the Flint study, and what you see is obeta-colic acid in blue. It hit its primary endpoint, it hit fibrosis improvement, it didn't get rid of NASH statistically speaking, but it did show a trend, and there was some improvement in steatosis. That triggered the phase three trial, which was regenerate, three different doses here of obeta-colic acid, and this is what it showed. The phase two trial looked amazing. The phase three, not quite as amazing. And what you see here was with NASH resolution with no worsening of fibrosis, it didn't really hit it. It did hit fibrosis improvement slightly with no worsening of NASH. Now, that's great. This is what it's gonna get FDA approved on, Ooh, did I forget to mention 58% of people get severe itching? So that's why I'm saying I wouldn't rush out and call my stockbroker, but remember, hep C therapy was sat for a decade and nothing exciting happened. As soon as the first hep C drug hit the market, multiple drugs came in over and over, same in the HIV world. So I think first to, to market is more important to me because of the concept of the research we're gonna see behind it, not that this will be the end all all. Now, a RAM call, the one that we're opening a study on next week, 
Again, this is a fatty acid, bile acid conjugate. This is the phase 2B trial. We're going to be doing the phase 3. But what you see here is encouraging data. Again, only a phase 2. But encouraging data, the amount of fat reduction in the liver was better in the high dose, and quite a significant amount of NASH resolution. Granted, we're still in the 20% range at uh, one year. So the point is we're going to open a phase three here. So what do I think the future of the future of NASH treatment is going to be? It's going to likely be a tailored approach as we started to kind of hint at earlier. And I think what we're going to have to do, unfortunately for now, is still do biopsies, but get an idea of where your patient sits on this spectrum. And if they're very early, just work on the risk factors, the diabetes, the obesity, the hyperlipidemia, lifestyle modifications. But once you start to get over here with the more advanced fibrosis, we're going to have to start to think about medicines that do three things. Maybe work on the metabolic parameters, decrease the inflammation, and ultimately decrease the fibrosis. Now, to get out of medical world, let's talk surgical world. So what about bariatric surgery? And again, probably the best treatment for obesity is bariatric surgery. Again, everyone in this room, with one exception sitting to my left over here, um, always looks at surgery as the failure of medical therapy. We need to get that old view out of our head. And the point is there are therapies that may be better served surgically than always thinking it must be medication, medication. So bariatric surgery. And what you'll find here, and again, I just pulled two. I could have pulled hundreds. But complete regression of NASH 90-ish percent of the time with the Ruin Y. Here we see improved fibrosis in half the patients. None of them develop cirrhosis, granted a short study. But the point is that bariatrics may have a very big role in these people. But there's two caveats to it. Number one, don't wait too long. By the time someone gets to cirrhosis, surgery of any kind, let alone bariatric, is going to be more difficult, higher morbidity, higher mortality. Number two, uh, do not send these people to... Uh, the man or woman who's done three surgeries in the last 10 years like this. So you see here on the bottom, the more surgeries your team does, the uh, morbidity mortality drops dramatically. Now, the guidelines also point out that you can see significant improvement in fibrosis scores. These are much bigger studies. And what you find here is that here is about a year after bariatric surgery, you have almost half the patients now have no fibrosis, and if you look here between 0, 1, and 2, you actually have pretty much everybody no fibrosis, and here you see a switch. Granted, the overall numbers are no different, but you see more of them in the 0 range. Keep in mind, this is a pre-selected study. They pick studies with early fibrosis to include. Now, the surgical recommendations from our medical society is that these can be considered. They're not yet considered standard of care for NASH, but the point is if they need bariatric surgery, then don't forget about bariatric surgery. And again, try and get to them before they have cirrhosis, or at least try and get to them before they have advanced decompensated cirrhosis. Since Ed is here in the audience, I will oftentimes, if I have a borderline cirrhotic, I will chat about the patient with Ed and or have Ed see him, one of my liver surgeons, to get an idea of what we think the risk and benefit is. And again, there's a lot of questions. Do they have varices? If they have varices, it's probably too late. If they've got ascites, it's probably too late. One of the things that we see over and over and over is the BMI of 60 patient that's been seen for 15 years and every time, lose weight, going to try, lose weight, going to try, and here we are 15 years later, they now have end-stage cirrhosis. So, and we can't transplant them either. We're not likely to transplant a BMI of 60. So the point is to get this pig-headed medical view that we all have, and I'm as guilty as anyone, get it out of your head that we can't send someone to a surgeon because it means we failed. And again, same thing with Crohn's ulcerative colitis. Now, what about transplant? Well, transplant here is very minimal amount of transplants were being done back in the late 90s for fatty liver 
it increased up here to 7.5% in 2010, keeping in mind that I'm not quite sure these numbers are accurate because I don't know what NASH is. Was that cryptogenic? Because we had categories of cryptogenic, meaning we don't know what it was. Well, looking back, almost assuredly, most or many of these cryptogenics were NASH or fatty liver. So likely these numbers were much higher, but at least classically listed as uh, NASH cirrhosis. Now, survival rates here, bottom line, they fall in the middle of other liver diseases. So survival is um, good, and this is a very accepted indication for transplant. And in fact, if we look here, let's take a look at this slide. And hepatitis C is the most common reason for liver transplant. And we didn't have great therapy. We were using interferon, and they were getting sicker and sicker. Well, what happens? We get great therapies for hep C, and this is 2016, 2020, this has dropped even further. And there may come a point where we almost never transplant hep C patients by curing everybody. But more importantly, what we see here is that NASH is rising, and NASH overtook hep C in 2017-2018, expected somewhere between 2020 and 2022, NASH will be the single most, import, most common reason for liver transplant. And so, again, think about NASH in advance, but like I said, if you send us BMIs of 60 for transplant, it ain't going to happen. So bottom line, we really want to think about our options before we get there, if we can. So in terms of tr post-transplant issues, we got problems. What are we going to do to them? We're going to hurt them with prednisone and cyclosporin and Prograf. And what do those things do? Weight gain, diabetes, or if they already had diabetes, worsening sugar, hyperlipidemia, etc. And so we're going to see those problems. We're going to see the weight gain come back over and over. Many times, not even just because the medicines, the patients feel better and they start to eat a little bit. They start to eat a little bit more. They're not on low-sodium diets, whatever. And what you're going to start to see here is that the single most important reason these people die five to ten years after transplant is not failure of the liver, rejection of the liver, liver cancer. They're going to die of cardiac events. Why is that a surprise? They had higher risk from metabolic syndrome and NASH before, and now those things are getting worse. So the point is we're trying to get very aggressive. We work with the <coughs> cardiologists, the endocrinologists very aggressively before, but also after transplant. So in conclusions, want it to be known fatty liver is extremely common and is by far the most common cause of liver disease in the U.S. and the world. The way I want you to look at fatty liver is the liver manifestation of the metabolic syndrome. So when the endocrinologists see them, they have to sort of incorporate that, I should say the primary cares as well, incorporate that into their thought process. Again, we have triggers that turn on inflammation and thus fibrosis. About 20 to 25% of NASH patients will go on to cirrhosis, and all the badness of NASH comes out of fibrosis. And again, despite the fact that we don't have massive randomized controlled trials, Still, the mainstay of therapy at this moment remains diet, weight loss, exercise. The more weight loss, the better. Vitamin E, pioglitazone, I don't use them in my practice. If someone's on pioglitazone, then I'm fine with that. Or if a primary calls and says, I have a fatty liver to patient, and I'm thinking of pioglitazone, then good. I can say, well, yeah, there might be some other reasons. But for the moment, I don't think it's a great first-line drug for just fatty liver disease. And then I think the point is over the next five years, we're going to be seeing more and more drugs. And I think what we're going to see really is going to be triple combination. We're going to see drugs that treat the metabolic syndrome. We're going to see drugs that treat the inflammation. And we're going to see drugs that treat the uh, fibrosis. And again, you'll have to decide what to do with the normal and abnormal LFTs. For the moment, in the absence of good treatment, many people would say if they have normal liver tests, then just keep an eye on them. Others screen them. You could debate that. And we actually did a debate this year at the uh, Liver Foundation. And again, don't forget bariatric surgery. Don't forget transplant. 
So at that point, I'll bring it to a close. And as I said, I put a lot of extra slides in there. It's archived on the computer. If people want to get in and get a little bit more detail, feel free or obviously just come find me or one of my partners. So open it up for any questions anybody might have. This is one of our best attended grand rounds of the year, so obviously good. both the topic and the speaker had a big draw. Um, seems like it's good job security for, for you and Dr. Sanchez. So, uh, <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, it's funny you say that because in so many ways, you know, we hate fatty liver in that, you know, you walk in and it's always the same person. It's BMI of 40, diabetes, hyperlipidemia. You sort of feel like, you know, you almost feel impotent. Just, there's nothing you can do. But you're right, it is job security. And I think the reason I like to give the grand rounds intermittently is just to remind people there is going to be more coming than just, you know, lose weight. Because in essence, like I said before, Bruce Bacon, when we've had him on the back, we haven't really come that far. And so, you know, we'll see. It seems like it starts with diet and hyperinsulinemia. And if we could address that effectively when people were kids, then 95% of this wouldn't happen. But... Nobody listens to me in terms of uh, glycemic index. Now, Keith is completely correct, and you've probably seen the studies, you know, in the last couple of years out of the big medical journals, usually New England, showing that this all starts in childhood. Mm -hmm. And childhood obesity is the cause of heart disease, stroke, fatty liver metabolic syndrome, and that's really our big problem. There's no question about it. Right. Yeah. Differentiating alcoholic liver disease from fatty liver disease, is the histopathology more uniform when steatohepatitis uh, involves the liver as opposed to the alcohol? It's a great question, Raj. And the answer is it depends which pathologist you speak to. Some will tell you, I can tell the difference. In all honesty, you probably can't. So Mallory's bodies, Mallory's hyaline, you can see with bad NASH and alcoholic hepatitis. It may be more in alcoholic hepatitis. PMNs attracting and killing off these cells with the Mallory's hyaline can be on both, maybe a little bit more in the alcoholic hepatitis patients. But in terms of the fat and the fibrosis, very, very tough. And, you know, where you're kind of going with that, I have a lot of patients that have ASH and NASH, and there's no question about it. I think those guidelines are ridiculous to allow up to 21 drinks a week and say that someone has so-called non-alcoholic. So, you know, when I talk about general care, in addition to diet, weight loss, exercise, I have the same other two recommendations, get vaccinated if needed and stop all alcohol. And one of the best answers I get to know if they have an alcohol problem is, what do you mean by stop all alcohol? Do I have, you know, and it's like when I'm debating somebody that we have an issue. But, you know, my theory is if I tell them to stop all alcohol, they'll at least hear what I said and I'll document it. If I tell them, well, you can have a couple drinks, you know, as you know, a couple drinks becomes three, six, 12. So at least my, my approach to it is that I tell them just to stop all alcohol. But, uh, you know, again, maybe they'll listen to half of what I said and they'll cut it down by half. Yeah. Now, keep in mind, I've gone out with Mike, and I've seen Mike down, uh, you know, dozen himself, so uh, a good Irish boy. But, yeah, I mean, I think anything that you can use or say to help them, to me, what I just tell them plain and simple is I tell them, I tell them the exact same thing. I say, I'm a liver specialist. You've got liver disease. Alcohol damages the liver. Just get rid of it. Or as Mike said, you know, it's like you specific. Because, you know, the question, the comment back why Mike's getting there is that they're always saying, hey, my neighbor drinks three times what I drink, and he's fine, you know. And the answer is, I don't care about your neighbor. There's something in you that the alcohol is triggering, triggering an issue. So whatever approach you take, I agree. I just would try and get rid of it. So if I could really tell someone you can have two drinks a week and they really would, I'd be fine with that. But I think that 21 is really pushing it. Yeah. Um, 
Well, I'm not sure because you saw those guidelines said one thing and then said something else. So if you go with the first line, what it says is that if there is no abnormality of the liver, then there's no reason to be looking for it. Having said that, what happens in clinical practice is they end up in our liver clinics because they have fatty liver, which usually means they got an ultrasound, sometimes CAT or MR, but uh, they either had abnormal liver tests or someone screened them just because of risk factors. Once you have fatty liver, I'm obligated to do some kind of a non-invasive something or other. We personally have been using the FibroScan or transient elastography. If uh, Pospilati was here, he would show you the data on MRI elastography that will hopefully replace ultrasound. So I think the answer is once you find fatty liver, you're pretty much obligated. Because there's no question, the higher your numbers, the higher the chance that your fatty liver is NASH and the higher the chance you're going to get fibrosis. But the converse isn't 100% correct. You can have normal liver enzymes, just as we saw in hep C, and still have bad liver damage, just less likely. So to answer your question the way I look at the guidelines, if they come in my office and they have fatty liver, I generally do a fibro scan on them. Yeah. So your solution, best solution is the behavior mm -hmm. in the way home. Um, what about the behavior leading to the annual liver disease? And what is, what is psychiatric comorbidity? Yeah, it's, it's really an interesting question. There's not been much written on that side of it. And everything has been written purely on the diet side. I have not seen, I've seen a couple little studies. I have not seen anything good really coming out of psychotherapy uh, literature research. Again, you'll always kind of see these, and you'll see it in the bottom of the uh, you know articles that push the dietary control. You know, say something like consider counseling or look into other issues. But I have not seen really good formal studies on it, or for that matter, good recommendations. But it's really a phenomenal point, and I think that. It really should be part of this approach. Because if you think about it, in the liver world, we ignore it. We don't pay attention to anything you just said. But in the bariatric world, it is one of the first steps in bariatrics. How in the world those two are not doing the same thing doesn't make sense. So that's really a great point. In fact, one that we probably should talk to Lena Caton and her colleagues about. It's really a great point. But for those of you that haven't worked with the bariatric clinic, you have to see the counselor, you have to see the therapist, you have to oftentimes see the psychologist to even get part, get into the uh, program. So it's really a great point. And it may help with these people you just say, oh, go lose weight, you know, because, again, it's just not that easy. If there's no further questions, I want to thank Dr. Cohen for a really fantastic talk. Thanks, Marty. Really important talk. Thank you.